our first study last evening, we, we really consider the background upon which we can now appreciate the life of Moses. His nation, you recall, steeped in idolatry, basically faithless, uh, immersed in the religion, you might say, of Egypt. His tribe, of the twelve, it would appear the most faithful. Certainly in the early years of the wilderness wanderings, the tribe of Levi distinguished themselves above all the other tribes in their conduct. His family, of whom I think there can really be no doubt whatsoever, both Amram and Jochebed, his parents, were extremely faithful people. Miriam and Aaron are spoken of in Micah chapter 6 as leaders of the nation with Moses. So you've got a remarkable family, therefore, that this boy was born into. Remarkable parentage, remarkable siblings from, we might say, a remarkable tribe in the nation. We look briefly at the circumstances in the early verses of Exodus chapter 2 surrounding his birth. And from what we've already seen, it's very clear that the beginning of Moses' life was the subject of considerable divine intervention. He was born not only into a faithful family, but condemned to death by a violent and oppressive ruler and saved out of that death uh, providentially and by the clear thinking of his parents. Well, as we read today, we're now going to begin shortly in, in Exodus chapter 2 from verse 11, which is sort of where we left off last evening. But I'll just, just take a look at verse 11, at least the first half of Exodus chapter 2 verse 11, because what you read there, it appears to be a very benign sort of comment. It simply says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren and looked upon their burdens. Now this really begins a new stage in Moses' life because, of course, the first ten verses are where Moses was an infant or at least very young, perhaps up to ten years old. And now we have in verse 11, Moses is grown. Acts chapter 7 and verse 23 is the New Testament commentary on this, and it tells us that Moses wasn't just grown, he was 40 years old. In fact, Acts says he was a full 40 years old when he went out and looked upon his brethren. And, of course, you can see in the subsequent verses we have the, the issue of him smiting the Egyptian, burying him in the sand, and so forth. The point is it sounds like a very natural thing, you see, as you start reading these verses from verse 11. But all you're given in Exodus chapter 2 are the facts, really just the bare facts of what Moses did that resulted in his own flight from the land of Egypt. The fact is that there's nothing random about what Moses does here. There's nothing haphazard. He doesn't just happen upon his people and sees an incident, gets involved, and everything goes bad and he has to leave the country. An awful lot of thought had gone into this by Moses before the transactions of these verses. And that's what we want to explore this afternoon. But to do that, we've got to fill out the story a little more, and you've got to go to the New Testament for that. So come with me to begin with to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 enlarges upon the background of Exodus chapter 2, because, of course, it describes here in some detail the life of Moses. And we already observed verses 20 and 21 of Acts chapter 7, that there's a contrast made in these two verses between the nourishment of two houses. Because in Acts chapter 7 and verse 20 it says that in which time Moses was born, he was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And so, of course, there's two different forms of nourishment which play upon the life of this boy. Two very different lifestyles. His father's house would have been a stable family, a hard-working environment, not a wealthy environment because, of course, they were slaves in Egypt, but an environment nevertheless centred upon the principles of the truth, whereas Pharaoh's house was exactly the opposite. It was a house of worldly ambition, a house of self-aggrandizement in this life, of man-made religion, totally foreign to the principles of the truth. The question then becomes, well... We know what Moses did when he was 10 years old, he was, or thereabouts, he was transferred from one house to another. We know what Moses did when he was 40 years old, he kills a man and has to leave the country. What did he do in the intervening 30 or so years? Well, verse 22 says that he was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and in deeds. Josephus suggests that he became a, a general of the Egyptian army that he made 
great inroads into the Ethiopians in the south, slaughtered countless thousands of people and finally contracted a political marriage with an Ethiopian princess. Well, needless to say, there's nothing in the Bible about that. But mighty in word and in deed would suggest that he was a prominent public speaker. It would suggest that he was a capable statesman of some kind. Obviously, he went to university. And if we can make the deduction that the Egyptian universities might have been much the same as the Babylonian universities that you read about in Daniel chapter 1, well, then we might surmise that he would learn all the wisdom of the Egyptians. All knowledge, understanding science. He was a man, you see, such as had the ability in him to stand in the king's palace. A, a boy that would be groomed to perhaps be a successor to the throne. And so very much like Daniel found himself in Daniel chapter 1, you can, you can imagine people thinking in the Egyptian court of Moses in the same sort of capacity. So what that would mean is that he'd have to learn world geography. He'd have to learn mathematics. He'd have to learn science, such as it was known then. He'd have to learn the, the legal codes of different civilizations. The Babylon, Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, for example, was already 300 years old by the time we read these events in Moses' life. He'd have to learn, what's more, the skills of statesmanship. He'd have to learn international protocols. He'd have to learn about diplomacy and negotiation and administration. All skills, of course, which would serve him extremely well later on in life. But Pharaoh's teaching them to him for a very, very different reason. But, you know, of all the things that Moses might have learned, I think there was one subject in particular which would have attracted his attention. Bear in mind, we've got a boy here who's in ecclesial isolation. He's got all the money that the world can throw at him. He's got all the toys that money can buy, but he doesn't have an ecclesia. And he's been groomed for a great position, and in the back of his mind, no, he knows he can never really accept the direction that Pharaoh's household is going to try and take him. And so of all of these subjects, I think one particularly would attract his attention, and that would be the subject of Egyptian history. Now, why would Egyptian history be so important? Well, it wasn't all that important, but one part of it particularly was very important. And you read of that in verses 9 and 10 of Acts chapter 7. The patriarchs, you see, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favour and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and over all his house. You see, there was a small epoch back in the recent history of Egypt where there was a Christadelphian heavily involved in the economy of that country. But you come with me, just hold Acts 7. Well, come with me to Psalm 105, because it goes a little further than that. <clears throat> Not only was Joseph an important man in Egypt, but you read of something particular that Joseph did when he was there in Egypt. Psalm 105, verse 20. It tells you this. Verse 17 of the psalm tells you that we're talking about Joseph here. So verse 20 of Psalm 105 says that the king sent and loosed him from prison. Even the ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house, ruler of all his substance, to bind his princes at pleasure and to teach his senators wisdom. So Joseph was employed in, in educational capacity in Egypt. How much do you suppose, therefore, of the wisdom of Egypt actually came from Joseph? And even though the current administration doesn't agree with the previous dynasty, they don't recognise Joseph in that sense, uh, the history couldn't be erased. The history was the history. And here's Moses uh, attending to books as he's been brought up in the house of Pharaoh's daughter, and he's got to consider Egyptian history, and lo and behold, he comes across the deeds of this Christadelphian who's now been dead for 100 years, wouldn't you think that he'd pay word by word attention to everything that Joseph did, everything that Joseph said, everything that was initialed with Joseph's initials? Because he was a major contributor, you see, to the faculty of wisdom in the nation of Egypt. It was Egyptian history. It would be written down. And for a young man, out of the direct influence of the truth, that history would be inspirational. 
You would have known it backwards. Everything Joseph did, everything Joseph said, you see. You see, brothers and sisters, how Joseph would become somewhat of a, of a mentor from the grave, you might say, but a mentor nevertheless for the young Moses as he's growing up in this household. Well, that's part of the picture. Now, you come with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's fill out that picture a little more. Because that household was going to make certain demands, you see, on Moses. It had invested a lot in him. And now it was payback time. And there were certain expectations, you see, that the court was going to have of Moses, like it perhaps would have of any politician. And he's going to have to start going step by step through the path that they've marked out for him. And in Hebrews 11 and verse 24, it tells you, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. And there's an awful lot there. What's it saying? Well, he refused to be called son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused the pleasures of sin, and he refused the treasures of Egypt, it says in those three verses. Instead, he sought affliction with the people of God, he sought the reproach of Christ, and he sought the reward of eternal life. So there's a very clear demarcation in Moses' mind between what Egypt can offer him and what the truth can offer him. And the point is that those, those two lists of, of three things are both synonymous. The son of Pharaoh's daughter, you see, would be a high-powered position. There would be no shortage of money, but it would be buried in sin. On the other hand, ecclesial life would be a life of privation. It would be the subject of personal ridicule, but there would be an ultimate reward of immortality. Now look at the details. Verse 24. He chose, when he came to years, not to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And you'll probably be aware that the definite article there, that is the word the, is not there. And it should be son, capital S, of Pharaoh's daughter. Because it's, it's not describing the relationship between Moses and his adopted mother. It's describing a position in the ranks of Egyptian nobility. So he refuses a promotion. That's the point. He refuses a position on the Senate, if you like, in Egypt. The reference appears to be to the throne that he is being groomed. So therefore, there'd be a ceremony. There'd be a formal transfer of responsibilities as Moses would become perhaps the heir apparent, which was unacceptable for him because if he was going to enter that level in the echelons of, of the Egyptian nobility, he would have to adopt the Egyptian religion. That was the state religion. The Pharaoh was worshipped as a god. So Moses was going to have to buy into all of that. Well, therefore, it was a promotion he couldn't accept. No way could, a motion, uh, could, could, could Moses accept a promotion that required him to, to, to take such an opposing view that the truth required. He had a choice to make, therefore. He was either going to remain son of Pharaoh's daughter or son of God, but he couldn't be both. And so what does he do, verse 25? He made a choice, and the choice was rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now think about what we know of the ecclesia. Well, the people of God here is the ecclesia in Egypt. So what do you know about the ecclesia in Egypt? Well, it wasn't worth much, was it? I mean, he left behind the pleasures of sin to seek an ecclesia only to find that they were enjoying the pleasures of sin, weren't they? He didn't enter a strong and vibrant ecclesia when he went out amongst his brethren in Egypt. That wasn't what he found, was it? They were blatant idolaters. I mean, that's the testimony of Joshua 24 and Ezekiel 20. They did serve idols in Egypt. But he knew from his own experience that even if that's what the ecclesia was like in a general sense, there would be pockets of faith. There would be a few faithful in that ecclesia, and that's where the truth would be found. So despite the fact, you see, that the nation, in a general sense were idolaters, there would be individuals that were not. And that would be who Moses would look for. And so verse 26, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Well, he certainly knew a lot about the treasures of Egypt. 
But what do you think he knew about Christ? What, did, what could he possibly know about Christ? Well, whatever it says in the Bible. What Bible? What Bible do you suppose Moses had to teach him about the Lord Jesus Christ? He had the book of Genesis, the oral version of the book of Genesis. So he's built, you've got to say, he's built a messianic hope on the promises to Abraham, hasn't he? Because he doesn't have much else about the Lord Jesus Christ. He might have understood something about the Melchizedek priesthood. He might have understood what Joseph taught about the promises that were going to be fulfilled. He had nothing else but 50 chapters of Genesis, did he? When was the last time you heard a lecture on the Abrahamic promises or on the covenant? And did it ever make you stop and think, you know, I've heard all of this before. Why am I hearing this again? Perhaps I could do the lecture better than what I just heard. Why didn't he say this quote? Brothers and sisters, this simple message of the Abrahamic promises was clearly what changed this man's life. And really, whether you hear it delivered well or not, the fact is you know the promises, and every time you go through those in your mind, there's an enormous power there of promises which are yet unfulfilled. And this man hung on to them in ecclesial isolation when he was offered all the money you can dream of. You've got to think again about the quality of these promises to Abraham, don't you? Now, as far as Moses is concerned, he's been wrestling, of course, with these issues for some time because he knew, he knew where things were leading. He'd have to. By the time this happens, he's the best part of 40 years old. And so he could see where this was all going to head, and he's going to be wrestling internally, saying, well, do I accept the promotion or not? Joseph did. Joseph did, and he saved his brethren because of the position he occupied in Egypt. But I'm being offered a different position. It's not so simple for me now. And this is a difficult trial, you see, because he knows that God's already worked in his life once, and he, he would see everything that came across his desk as perhaps providential or perhaps a trial. Well, which one was it? Which, which way do I go? You see, life wasn't, it wasn't especially simple for him to make these decisions. He's already got a pretty high position. But he knows that if he takes it, this next step, he's going to compromise the truth. So he's got to make a decision. And it tells us that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Well, this refusal couldn't be anything but public, could it? Couldn't be anything else. And there are going to be serious implications. What's wrong with him? Is he unwell? Is he under stress? Look at what we've done for him. You'd think he'd be grateful. Look at all the money we've spent on him. You think about the pressure that would be brought to bear on Moses. You know, it happened in my life once. I had a, I had a cousin who, a cousin, not in the truth, was going to get married. And I said to mum, what do I care about this? What do I care about this cousin who's not going to, you know, not in the truth? I'm not going to go to the wedding. Whoa, it went from the mother to the sister to the aunt. It went around the whole family. And I got a message coming back. Well, you know, it didn't matter to me especially. But the point is, it was only a wedding of a cousin I really didn't really see much of. This is far more significant. So you can imagine the pressure that would come back when Moses said to his adopted mother, look, I don't think I'll take that, mum, thanks. Well, that would go to dad, and then back to mum, and then back to Moses, and we'd, we want to have to sit, have a sit down, son, and have a, have a good discussion about this. Well, I've, I haven't changed my mind. Then we'll bring a few more people into discussion and have another good discussion about this. And you can imagine this going on and on before Moses has to make his position very, very clear. Well, now he's in disgrace. He's let the family down. The royals all think he's a delinquent. You can imagine what things are like in the palace. Now, understanding all of that, come back to Acts chapter 7. Because Moses has got something on his mind, you see. He's got another plan. And it doesn't really involve Pharaoh's daughter. Because in Acts chapter 7 and verse 23, it tells us that when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. What do you mean it came into his heart? Well, we see we've got a problem because whatever came into Moses' heart was going to cost a man his life. He thought, you see in verse 25, that everybody would get the point. Verse 25, he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver him. But they didn't understand. Well, nobody got the point. 
Moses goes and does this deed. He thinks everybody's going to join the dots. Everyone's going to get the point. They're all standing around looking at him like there's something wrong with him. What are you going to do? Kill me like you killed the last fellow? So what's Moses doing? What exactly is going through Moses' mind? Well, I'll show you exactly what's going through his mind. You come back with me to Genesis 41. Back to the life of Joseph. Because you see, he sees himself as somewhat of a copy of Joseph. And you can understand why. Providence has acted in his life in a similar manner to which it acted in Joseph's life. And so now he thinks that God's going to use him in the same way that he used Joseph. Now, there are some references that bear upon this. For example, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, God said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed will be in a stranger, that thy seed will be a stranger in a land that's not theirs. They'll serve them, they'll be afflicted 400 years, but in the fourth generation they'll come hither again. Moses already knows he's the fourth generation. He knows that deliverance has got to happen in his lifetime. Genesis 50, verse 24, Joseph said to his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you to bring you out of the land which he swore to Abraham. So he knows Joseph has reiterated the promises to Abraham, which, of course, is Moses' Bible. He goes out to visit his brethren. Can you see a, a significance there between what he does and the words of Joseph? But he does it when he's a full 40 years old. Now, what's the point there? Well, here's the point. Genesis 41, verse 46. Joseph, it says, was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he's been in prison for a few years. He's now 30 years old. And he's going to stand and become number two in the empire. Verse 53, Genesis 41, verse 53. And seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Harold's Joseph. Well, he's 37, isn't he? Genesis 42, verse 1. Now, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, he says to his boys, what are you looking at each other for? Go down to Egypt and buy corn. That's the first year of the famine. Harold's Joseph. He's 38. Genesis 43, verse 1. The corn runs out. Jacob says to the boys, go back and get some more, verse 1. The famine was sore in the land. It came to pass they'd eaten their corn. What's happening? It's the second year of the famine. Harold's Joseph. He's 39. Genesis 45, verse 6. Well, you know the story of Joseph. One thing leads to another. He gets all the boys in front of him and he reveals himself to them. How old is he when he reveals himself to them? Genesis 45, verse 6. These two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. Joseph's 39 years old when his brethren stand in front of him. By the time he got dad down to the land as well, he was 40 years old. And it says in Acts chapter 7, when Moses was a full 40 years old. What's the point of that? He's waiting for God to use him, isn't he? Just like God used Joseph. Joseph delivered his family, you see, when he was 40 years old. And Moses is looking for a sign, looking for a sign, waiting for something to happen to tell him that at 40 years old and the clock's ticking and he's getting near his 41st birthday and he's a full 40 years old. He's desperate for a sign. And he interprets the first thing that happens as a sign and one thing leads to another. So can you see what is going through Moses' mind? I think it's pretty clear. Exodus chapter 2 said when he was come of age. There's an awful lot more than just coming to years. He got to a specific year, modelling his, his life upon a specific man. And nobody understood. Nobody understood all. So come with me to Exodus chapter 2. Look what happens. So you can see the tension, brothers and sisters, in this man. He's in his 40th year waiting for something to happen. He saw Joseph accept promotion. He saw Joseph deliver Israel. He knows he can't quite do the same thing because of the religious implications. He hates the things of Egypt. He's going to make his greatest decision for the truth. Pharaoh's upset. 
He's burning his bridges pretty fast. He's upset the entire family. He goes out amongst his people. And verse 11 of Exodus chapter 2 says, It came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren, looked upon their burdens, and he spies an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Oh, it's the divine sign that I've been waiting for. God's going to use me today. This must be what it means. Now, before I get to that, you know, I think there's another reason he went out amongst his brethren. And he looks upon their burdens. Now, what do you think Moses had to understand about their burdens? I mean, he knew how slaves worked. He knew what the Jews were being used for. I don't think there's a lot of education that watching what the work of the Jews was would give Moses. I think, however, when you come to chapter 5, verse 14, we've got another clue about what Moses was looking for amongst the burdens of his people. It tells you in Exodus 5, verse 14, that the officers of the children of Israel, which Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten. And they demanded, wherefore have you not fulfilled your task making bricks today like yesterday, and so forth. What is the point? The point is we have Egyptian taskmasters, under them we have Hebrew officers, and under them we have Hebrew slaves. So there's a structure amongst the slaves. There's a hierarchy. The nation's already organised into companies, and each one of those companies has a Hebrew commander. Now you think about Moses' education. What would Moses make of that? What possibilities do you suppose Moses could see in that? I think it would be fair to say he probably saw some good military possibilities. He's already got the organisation of a standing army amongst the Jews. That combined with his leadership and God's obvious will, the nation's superior numbers would make them invincible. Obviously, that was Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's major concern back in chapter 1 of Exodus and verse 10. That's why he was drowning baby boys. Uh, the numbers of Israel were a concern to him. But you just, just think about this from Moses' point of view as he goes out to apparently spy the burdens of his people. An awful lot more to it than that. We'll come back to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 11. He spies an Egyptian, it says, smiting a Hebrew, one of his brethren. Well, it's likely that the refusal of the throne is reasonably well known by now. His Hebrew origin has already obviously been known for some time. He might expect at least a favourable reception by his people. And now this, well, you'd have to say things are playing right into his hands, wouldn't you? Verse 12 goes on. He looked this way and that way. When he saw there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. Acts 7 verse 24 says of this verse, seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him. So here's a man mighty in word and deed. He defends him in word, he avenges him in deed. That's what Moses did, hides his body in the sand. Verse 13, and when he went out the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. So he sees an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew, he deals with that, and now he sees Hebrews fighting Hebrews. Acts, 20, Acts 7 and verse 26 says he showed himself to them the next day. He'd refused the ceremony in the court of Pharaoh. He thought he'd be accepted with equal enthusiasm amongst his own people. Well, verse 13 says... The two Hebrews were striving. He gets involved. Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? Do you intend to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? Well, nothing could have prepared him for that. Nothing could have prepared him for that. Moses is devastated by verse 14. Everything he's done for the nation, everything he's invested in this venture, you see, and he's done it all for the truth. And the wheels have come off. Everything's coming to pieces. You see, so God's forsaken him. This wasn't a sign from God at all. It was a trick. And now everybody knows. And he's shown his hand. And now he's in big trouble. Well, everybody knows, all right, because verse 15 says, and we're, when, well, he says at the end of verse 14, the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses, it tells you. Of course, Pharaoh put two and two together very quickly. Now everything made sense. We've got a traitor in our midst after all we've done for him. Ordinarily, you know, Moses could have killed thousands of Egyptians. He perhaps could have killed thousands of Hebrews and Pharaoh wouldn't have blinked an eye. Not anymore. Not anymore. 
He's shown his hand now, hasn't he? You know, in Exodus 18 and verse 4, when Moses names his second boy, it says, I named him because Eliezer because Yahweh delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. What that tells you in verse 15 is that straight away the police are out. He can't go to the palace, can't go back to his family, can't go to Israel. He's got to get out. And they almost got him. They almost got, Yahweh delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Pharaoh almost got him. And off he goes across the border, you see. What went wrong? Well, this is what went wrong. Acts chapter 7, verse 25. He supposed his brethren would have understood that God by his hand would deliver them. And they didn't understand. Forty years later, what we find in Acts 7 verse 35 is that God did use Moses who became a tool in God's hand and the record tells us that it was by the hand of the angel that appeared to him in a bush. So, so he was a man who thought he could do things in God's time the way he wanted didn't realise, in fact, that God had an entirely different plan. He's going to use Moses in an, in an entirely different way. And Acts, as you'll see in chapter 7 there, makes the contrast between the hand of Moses and the hand of the angel. And one hand fought the other. And it was doomed to failure, therefore, at 40 years old, and there was nothing he could do. But look at the preparation in his mind. Everything that happened to Joseph, you see, happened to Moses. He was a goodly man, just like Moses was when he was born. Nursed up in his father's house. God was with him. He increased in wisdom. He was elevated by Pharaoh. Both of those boys forsook Egypt. He was accepted by his brethren eventually, in Joseph's case. He delivered his brethren eventually, in Joseph's case. Joseph brought the family to Egypt. Moses would take the family out of Egypt. But you can see Moses is modelling himself upon the great deliverer, that Egyptian history has taught him about. The problem was, Moses wanted to pick up where Joseph left off. Joseph never began where Joseph left off. This is where Joseph began. All the formative years of training of Joseph, Moses has never seen. Moses has never been a shepherd. He's never even contemplated getting his hands dirty like that. And there was a time, you see, when Joseph was a shepherd and when he sought his brethren and he was rejected by them. And they said to him, shall thou indeed have dominion over us? Shall our sheaves really bow down to, the, to you? Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us, Joseph? Who do you think you are telling us a dream like that, Joseph? And he finds himself exiled, Joseph does. A slave, actually. He marries in Egypt, actually. And father's two sons, just like Moses was subsequently to do in Midian in his own exile. You see the point? There's no question there's a parallel between Joseph and Moses. It's just that their lives were lived the opposite way around. Moses was a shepherd, then he was a deliverer. Sorry, Joseph was a shepherd, then he was a deliverer. Moses thinks he can start off by being a deliverer. God says, I'm sorry, that's not the way it works. You've got to do your time with the sheep. And that's going to be 40 years. 40 years. And so he doesn't know this, of course, but now he flees from the face of Pharaoh, flees for his life. Where does he go? Well, he's in the north of Egypt. He's really got, I suppose, three choices. He could go south, he could go west, or he could go east. Well, what would you do? You're not going to north. North is the sea. You're not going to go to the south, it's just desert and it's more and more of Egypt. Egypt went very, very far south. He's got to get out quickly. But what is there west? There's not much, there's Libya. He goes east because he goes to Midian. Why does he go east? Now think again about what Moses would know about the geopolitics of the region. He's a man that would have a pretty good idea about trade routes, about foreign kings, about foreign economies, uh, about the history of some of these countries. And amongst all the stories he'd read, he'd read about a man from a distant land who was very rich, who came upon very hard times, the greatest of all the men in the East. 
And Job, you see, hasn't been dead long. But Moses knew that somewhere out there, Job had once lived. He was a Christadelphian. He was a descendant of Abraham. Eliphaz, the Temanite who came to Job, is himself the grandson of Esau. Job, it, lives, it appears, lived at the time when the nation of Israel was in Egypt. Well, Moses knows that somewhere out there there's an ecclesia, and he's got to go and find it. And that's why he goes east, because there are brethren out there. There's a whole nation, national ecclesia, if you like, in Egypt. But out there, way out there east, he's heard stories come across his desk of faithful people. And off he goes. He's got no choice. He's got to go east. Because he's looking for the ecclesias in the east. We'll come back to Acts chapter 7. We know what happened. He meets an ecclesia in the east. Not as far east as the land of ours, but in the east nevertheless. And it's the ecclesia of Jethro. And he finds, of course, he finds himself in fellowship with Jethro. Acts chapter 7 and verse 39. Sorry, verse 29. Moses then fled Moses at this saying, and he was a stranger in the land of Midian where he begat two sons. He arrives in Midian. In the process of time, he meets the family of Jethro. He's desperate for sanctuary, of course. He goes to the only place he knows, and he's going to stay there now for 40 years. And as we're going to see, he doesn't enjoy that 40 years one bit. From this point of his life, it appears he begins a gradual but consistent spiritual decline gets very, very depressed. There's nothing commendable ever written about this epoch of Moses' life. In Acts 7 and verse 29, where we are, Stephen, painting Moses somewhat as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, devotes one verse to this period of Moses' life. Hebrews chapter 11, which records four verses upon Moses, the three we read in the preceding verse, I think might be verse 26 of Hebrews 11, which talks about Moses being delivered of his parents. Four verses of Moses' life says nothing at all about the time that Moses was in Midian, and it occupied a third of his life in Midian. Not a word, not a mention. Stephen, you know, just as you look at Acts chapter 7, as Stephen speaks here, he divides Moses' life into the great epochs that it was. You read in verse, 30, uh, verse 23, 40 years. Verse 30, 40 years. Verse 36, 40 years. So he spent 40 years in Egypt. He spent 40 years in Midian. He spent 40 years in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 34 verse 7 says he only lived 120 years. The point is you've got nothing on this middle 40 years. It was a completely bleak period in Moses' life. He thinks God's forgotten him. It feels like a complete failure. Overnight, everything's changed. It's almost from, from riches down to rags, isn't it? He's depressed. He's embarrassed. He can't show his face ecclesially anymore. He's completely misunderstood the divine purpose. Doesn't have any answers now to all those miraculous events that happened in the early years. Can't see any purpose in any of this whatsoever. It says in verse 29 that he begat two sons. The eldest of those sons was Gershom. Gershom means stranger. Strong's translates it, refugee. That's how he feels by the time he's having his sons in, in Midian exiled, dispossessed, hopeless. And for another 40 years, God's going to work on his character. You see, for the most of the first 40 years, he was educated in Egypt. He's taught discipline, etiquette, leadership, all the attributes that would make him a good governor in the land. Groomed, as we said, for a, a prominent position in this empire. But with that education comes self-confidence, comes arrogance, comes independence, comes pride. So there's the question. How do you take a man, brothers and sisters, and give him all the skills that you're going to need him to have to lead a nation of two million people and keep him humble at the same time? Well, you send him to the best university in the world. He gets A pluses in everything he studies. Everybody's clapping their hands and, and patting him on the back. And then you take him out and you screw him up. You pull him to pieces and you rebuild him like you want him. How else is there to do it? Look what he had become at 40 years old. He had all the skills. He could speak like you've never heard. But could God use him? Of course not. Could any ecclesia use him? Of course not. 
So God now takes him out into the wilderness to take him to pieces. Nothing, you know, breeds inactivity, says Melba Perkis. Sorry, nothing breeds doubt more insidiously than inactivity. There's no greater test of patience than indeterminate waiting. It's a lesson which all disciples of Jesus must learn. So often, especially in the eager devotion of youth, obedience to the call of God is thought to imply an entire redirection of the whole life. There are new worlds to conquer, deep wrongs to right, great deeds to be done. Slowly we realise that the Father's business takes us back to the carpenter's shop, to things we thought we might have left behind, to the slow discipline of patience and steadfast devotion to a long period of waiting upon God. And this was it, you see. Moses might have been ready to take on the world at 40 years. By no means was God ready to use Moses for anything at 40 years. He's out there in the desert, reduced basically to nothing. He's just a shepherd, just a meagre shepherd. No clue when this would end, no apparent point to any of it. He's just running around in circles behind a flock of sheep. There would obviously be a cost to Moses spiritually. He's nowhere near an ecclesia. But this is going to be the cost that's required to pay to remove the insidious influence of Egypt, you see. But having reduced him to nothing, God's now going to build him back into the man that he can use, into the man that he wanted him to be, and the man that he has actually sent him to get this education for. That would happen through the plagues. God will take Moses from the humility of Midian and fashion him into the arm of God. This is what's going to happen. And after 40 years, God appears to him. Verse 30 of Acts chapter 7. And when 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. By this time, you see, God had judged that Moses would be ready to listen. He had to learn the disciplines and the patience of the wilderness to appreciate this message. And the message comes in verse 31. Moses saw it. He wondered at the sight. And he drew near to the bush to behold the voice of the Lord that came to him. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, verse 32 says. I've seen the affliction of my people, he says. I'm going to deliver them, and I'm going to use you, and you're going to go back to Egypt. And we're told in verse 30 that it was an angel that appears to him. It's most likely the angel of the name, the angel that, in fact, would go before the nation, probably Michael the archangel. This was the angel that's going to reform Moses as well. It describes this angel in verse 35. At the end of verse 35, Moses, whom they refused, the same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. The angel which appeared to him in the bush. You know, in the last month of Moses' life, just before he died, when he writes the book or dictates the book of Deuteronomy, he reflects on upon, upon all of these things again, and he prays in Deuteronomy 33, verse 16, that he might receive the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush. He's speaking of Joseph. He says, I want you to receive the goodwill of him that dwelt in the bush. Not just the goodwill of God, but of him that dwelt in the bush. You see, there's a remarkable relationship now is going to be developed between Moses and the angel that he meets in the bush. So what really happened at the burning bush? Well, he sees a bush. And he sees an angel in a flame of fire. He sees this fiery being, therefore, in the bush. But the bush itself is not on fire. Well, what does it represent? Well, it doesn't represent destruction because the bush was never burned up. It represents affliction, a, a, uh, an affliction that purifies. Now, the word bush in Exodus 3, verse 2 is the Hebrew word senna, which means to prick or to pierce. So it appears as though this was, in fact, the thorn bush. So Moses sees in the backside of the desert a thorn bush on fire, and an angel speaks to him from the fire. And the point simply would be that God's glory would be manifested in a humble thorn bush. And Moses, in verse 31 of Acts 7, it says that he wonders at the sight. He has an immense desire to know the secret of the bush. Why was the bush not consumed? Well, the answer, of course, is that the bush was a vehicle of divine manifestation. 
There's no purpose in consuming the bush. It simply exists to bear the glory of God. That bush would come to represent the nation of Israel. They were simply meant to be, or meant to become, a vehicle that could bear the glory of God. Simply a vehicle to, to, to hold the character of God. There's no point in consuming them. God needs a vehicle to bear his character. At this point, there is no nation of Israel. They're all slaves in Egypt. There's only Moses. So the first application, therefore, of the burning bush would be to Moses personally. That was going to begin his relationship with this angel, which would last the rest of his life. Affliction, refining, purification. He was simply meant to be a humble thorn bush that would bear the character of God. That was his job. That was all God wanted him to do. Oh, yes, mighty in word and deed, these, these qualities would need to be used. But at the bottom of it all, he was just a bush. And the minute that bush thought it was anything better than a bush, God would burn it down and get a new bush. He just wants a vehicle to bear his character. And that's what Moses has got to learn. You see, now come back to Exodus 3. Look what happens at the bush. God says, Moses, I'm going to send you back to Egypt. What does Moses say? No, you're not. I'm not going. I'm not going to do it. You know, we talk about the bush being a, a vehicle for the character of God. It's a lofty thought in a sense, and at this point, too lofty for Moses. Exodus 3, verse 11. Moses says to God, Who am I, he says, that I should go into Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? I can't do it. I'm the last person, he says, that you should be asking. And we're going to begin now a conversation between Moses and the angel of the bush. And Moses is going to find a lot of reasons why it's clearly impossible for him to go back to Egypt. And here's the first one. Verse 11 of Exodus chapter 3. I'm the last person you should be asking. Don't send me back to Egypt. The answer comes back in verse 12. Don't worry. I will be with thee. There will be no problem. Verse 13. Moses says to God, well, yes, but behold, when I come to the children of Israel and say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they'll say to me, what's his name? What am I supposed to say to that? You know what happened the last time I pretended to be a deliverer. They said, who do you think you are? Well, what am I supposed to say this time, he says. I can't just walk in and deliver the children of Israel. The answer comes back in verse 14. You tell them that Yahweh has sent you. You go to the elders of Israel in verse 16. They'll listen to you. And then take those elders before Pharaoh in verse 18. He won't listen to you, verse 19. And as a consequence of that, I'm going to punish Egypt. And eventually, verse 22, they'll pay you to leave Egypt. That's the discussion. Chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and said, But behold, they won't believe me. They won't believe me, nor hearken to my voice, for they will say, Yahweh has not appeared to you at all. You're lying, Moses. I can't do it. They won't believe me. That's the third refusal. He's having a discussion with Michael the archangel. He's just refused three times to do what he was told to do. Three times. Well, so God gives him the ability to perform miracles in the early verses of chapter 4. The rod becomes a serpent, the hand becomes leprous, the water becomes blood. Verse 10, go to Egypt, God says. Verse 10, Moses said to Yahweh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent. Fourth refusal, I'm not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken to thy servant. I'm slow of speech, I'm of a slow tongue. I can't speak, he says. Never could, really. Never have been eloquent. Mighty in word and deed. What do you make of that? Can't speak, never could speak. The angel's losing patience. Verse 11, Yahweh says to him, Who hath made man's mouth? Who maketh the deaf or the dumb, or the seeing or the blind? Have not I, Yahweh? Don't you think I know if a man can speak? Don't you think I know if a man can see? I'm the creator. Don't tell me you're slow of speech. I'm the creator, he says. Now therefore, verse 12, Go and I'll be with thy mouth and I'll teach thee what thou shalt say. 
And Moses says in verse 13, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou would send. New International Version. O Yahweh, please send someone else to do it. Fifth refusal. Well, this has gone on long enough. This is the God who's slow to anger. Moses is putting himself in a serious position. This is, you see, this is what 40 years in Midian has done. Completely reduced his spirituality, completely reduced his self-confidence. He's an extremely depressed man. He's no, no, got no confidence in himself whatsoever, even though he knows the decorum of the court of Pharaoh. He knows what would have to be done. He just does not feel as though he can do it, even with divine assistance. What do you do with a man like that? Oh, he's going to go anyway. That's what's going to happen. He's going to go anyway. But he's in an extremely poor spiritual state. You want to see the proof of that? Verse 25 of Exodus, Exodus 4, he's forgotten to circumcise his second son. In Genesis 17, Abraham was told that the, the man-child whom you don't circumcise should be cut off from his people because he's broken my covenant. In today's language, in verse 25 of Exodus 4, Moses has forgotten to baptize his boy. Well, just what kind of a Christadelphian do you suppose he is by the time he's done 40 years in Midian? Well, not much. Not much. Things are at an extremely low ebb, but he's going back anyway. And you see, it was those 10 plagues that began to now rebuild the character of Moses. You, you look at it. He's not a confident man. But look at it, Exodus chapter 7, verse 6. Look what it says. And you see, you can see the change in Moses. Exodus 7, verse 6, the plagues begin. Moses and Aaron did as Yahweh commanded them, so did they. Verse 20, Moses and Aaron did as Yahweh commanded. Chapter 8, verse 13, Yahweh did. According to the word of Moses, there's a change, isn't there? Yahweh did according to the word of Moses. Chapter 8, verse 30. Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated Yahweh, and Yahweh did according to the word of Moses. So it began with Moses and Aaron doing what they were told. By the time you get towards the end of the plagues, God's doing what Moses says. Now, there's a harmony between them, of course, but Moses is taking charge so that as the plagues progress, they convert Moses. And he regains the confidence that he has in the truth and that, in fact, he can be a valuable servant of God. And throughout those months, you see, the angel develops Moses into one of the greatest men that ever lived. He had all the building blocks in the first 40 years, but with them came arrogance and pride. So he takes him out into the desert for 40 years it reduces him and pulls him back to pieces and rebuilds him the way he can use him. So that when Moses finally appears to the nation, what did they see? What did they see when he finally... Well, I'll show you. You come with me in conclusion to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is what the nation saw when Moses finally appeared to them at 80 years old. A very different man to what they saw at 40 years old. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And isn't this the point, brothers and sisters, young people? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Now think about that. Not many wise men, educated in all the wisdom of Egypt, it said. Not many mighty men, mighty in word and in deed, it said. Not many noble, it says. This was the prince of Egypt. Offered son of Pharaoh's daughter, not many noble. Verse 27. Instead, God's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. The base things of the world, those things that are despised, God's chosen. The things which are not, he's chosen to bring to naught the things that are. And there's the dismantling of Moses' character, you see, back into building blocks. Verses 27, 28. Forty years in Midian as a shepherd. He's just a thorn bush. He's just a humble thorn bush. And what for? Verse 29. 
that no flesh should glory in my presence, says God. That salvation might come by the arm of God and not by the arm of Moses. And so then God puts them back together through the plagues. And here he comes, chapter 2, verse 1. Back into Egypt he comes, I, brethren, he says, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God when he came to Egypt. Didn't come with excellency of speech. Never really was a good speaker, as he's now decided. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified, because the reproaches of Christ are greater than all the treasures of Egypt. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, affliction, refining, purification, you see, as he's built up throughout the course of the plagues. And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Not eloquent. Not me. Never have been, really. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Because, brethren, he would say, I, don't, I want you to reflect the character of God. I don't want you to reflect the character of Moses. This is Moses, brothers and sisters. This is the man that God educated, dismantled, and rebuilt. Now he's a man that God can really use. And from this point, the world will never be the same again.